Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the joint meeting of the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society. Um, this is the Forum on Sustainable Agriculture, and it is our goal to have this be a dialogue among us. Uh, we're not just here to hear each other's talks. We have time, a lot of time for us to discuss ideas, to go in new directions. We are here to talk about what is really one of the grand challenges uh, that the world faces. We're heading toward what I'd like to call a full Earth. Um, oh, good. My, my, my graph has something weird in the middle of it, but yours doesn't. So, I mean, that's a, that's a graph of, of human population, uh, and that ended in, I graphed it in the year 2000. We're up uh, 1.8 billion people from then. Uh, within another 100 years, another 80 years, we'll be leveling off at around 11 billion. So, that's almost twice as tall as that line. So, you can see this almost a flat line followed by what looks, what's going to look like a straight line up over a two-century period where we go from 1 billion people to 11 billion people. So we are going to be a full Earth that way. Um, we're also becoming a full Earth in a different way, which is very good and very bad. Uh, it's very good because the whole world is becoming middle class. Nation after nation after nation are, are undergoing industrialization. They're becoming education-dependent societies. Uh, birth rates are falling, uh, incomes are rising. So the b black lines here show actual per capita income in real dollars, uh, 1990 dollars. Just if you feel nostalgic for 1990, that's what these are. Uh, and uh, the white bars above that are the projected increases uh, in per capita income in nations ranging from A, the 20 richest nations in the world, down to G, the 20 poorest nations out of the 100 most populous uh, nations in the world. And so you can see where the richest countries are, the 20 richest countries right now, that that income will be exceeded by those in the next 20 countries and will almost be matched by those in the next and even the ones in, in the, uh, uh, the rest from D on down or what we might call developing and, uh, or low middle and low income countries, huge increases in per capita income projected there. So it is not just that we're going to have 11 billion people, 11 billion people, 11 billion people from the 7.8 is only a 35 or so percent increase. We're talking about global per capita income going up 350 to 400 percent in the next 50 years, which means that uh, the demand for various products will go up, and one product that will have a lot of increase in demand is crop production. This shows the income dependence, per capita income dependence of crop production uh, for the 100 biggest nations in the world, divided into these economic groups from A, the richest, to G, the poorest. Uh, and each dot is a year from 1961 until around 2007 or so. And you can see that the demand for crop calories goes up very rapidly with income. Uh, in fact, if you look at this, the typical person in a, a rich Western country uh, has to have about 8,500 kilocalories of of, of, of crop produced per day, per person, to meet their needs, much of which is eaten for them by the livestock which they eat. But because of these, and here's what's happening to uh, population uh, around the world and what's projected by the UN uh, medium um, estimate. Uh, so for each of these countries, there are the number of people they have now and what they will have uh, in uh, 2050. And if you sort of take the income dependence of caloric demand and the change in population for each of these uh, economic groups, multiply those out and add them all up. Uh, the prediction is we're going to need, going from 20, 2006 to 2050, about a doubling in global food demand. And it's going to double again uh, or, or more uh, in the next 50 years as we go from 2050 to the 11 billion people. So four times more crop demand if things keep going the way they are going. That's really why I say we're on a full Earth, because we are going to be demanding an incredible amount from Earth uh, uh, because of this. And we do, chase, we do face this major global food challenge. And our goal today is to talk about how we might be able to come up with sufficient and secure food supply for all people on Earth, not just now, but 50 years and 100 years from now, and hopefully well beyond that, how we might be able to minimize uh, the environmental impacts of how this food is produced, which is, means we have to find ways to be more efficient and precise in how we uh, produce crops. And at the same time, there's this 
global nutrition transition happening with people eating uh, foods that are less and less healthy for them. Uh, and we have to find ways that we can actually improve human health via Im improved nutrition and dietary shifts. And then the final sort of grand challenge of all of this is that it's very easy to solve one of these problems and create a problem in one of the other areas. And that is the truly grand challenge because you have to consider all of these simultaneously if you're trying to map out a real viable solution for a healthy, uh, uh, a healthy world, uh, ecologically a healthy world for human health and a sustainable world. So that's all we have to do today and tomorrow. Um, so a variety of things, nitrogen, very important for food production. There is global nitrogen uh, production uh, from uh, 1960, the beginning of the Green Revolution until now. We went from 10 uh, teragrams of N, 10 million metric tons of N fertilizer being used in agriculture. Now we're at 110. Um, there are plausible scenarios in which you might imagine that could be three times more by the time we reach uh, uh, 50 years from now. I hope not. And we know nitrogen is incredibly important for feeding people, but we also know that nitrous oxide that comes from applying nitrogen is a major greenhouse gas. It accounts for about 10% of current uh, global warming uh, releases each year. Uh, it could easily account for three times that in uh, 50 years. We know that the nitrogen that isn't retained in aquatic, eco in the terrestrial ecosystems in farmland ends up going into aquatic systems, groundwater, lakes, river streams, uh, dead zones in the ocean. And we know that much of the nitrogen that is applied, um, well, not much of it, but a portion of the nitrogen that is applied goes into the air as ammonium, first from the fertilizer, but also from livestock operations. Ammonium is the nucleation site for the formation of very fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, 2.5 micron particulate matter, uh, that causes major health impacts. In fact, in the United States alone, about 20,000 people have premature deaths because of pollution caused by uh, agricultural emissions of PM 2.5. Um, so efficiency. Um, to try to reduce nitrogen water pollution in Europe, the EU passed something called the Nitrate Directive in the mid-1990s. And this shows what happened to yields. This is Italy. The yield of all their crops combined, measured in tons of crop protein produced uh, per hectare per year. And each dot is a, is a year from 1960 uh, to, um, oh, it must be 2010. I don't know why it doesn't say that here. Um, and what you can see happening, the red dots are dots, uh, are, are dots after this nitrate directive. When farmers had to basically show quantitatively how much nitrogen they needed uh, to produce their crop to be able to get a permit to buy their fertilizer, which is what, how it worked in, in the EU, they suddenly began using less nitrogen, but their yields kept going up. And so the nitrate directive designed to improve water quality actually led to about 44% more food production per ton of applied nitrogen fertilizer in Italy. And the same thing happened across Europe. Uh, it also happened in Mexico for a different reason. Uh, in Mexico, Fertilizer had been subsidized uh, from green revolution times until the mid-1990s. The subsidy was faded out, and as it faded out, farmers used nitrogen more efficiently. All economists will find that reassuring. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's, it shows there's room to use these inputs more efficiently. The, the great million farmer study in China, which I'm not going to do more than talk about for a sentence, showed that also when farmers are given the information on the best optimal amount of nitrogen fertilizer to apply, uh, and did this over a 10-year period, compared to the farmers who did not have this information, uh, they had equally good yields, but they used about 20 to 25 percent less nitrogen. So again, a big increase in efficiency that way. Pesticides. Almost none were used before the Green Revolution began, uh, and now uh, massive amounts of pesticides are used. Clearly, we know ways to use pesticides more wisely, um, and lots of the pesticides that have been used that are volatile organic compounds, dissolve in the air. They're spread around the world like any other dissolved substance and precipitate out of the air like any other uh, dissolved substance when it gets to be cold enough. So much of these things, many of these things get pumped up toward polar regions, north and south poles, and what look like the most pristine habitats in the world have some of the highest levels of uh, pesticide residues in the animals living there. 
Okay, now, let me see, there we go. Clearly, to get more food, we can increase yields of crops or we can have more cropland, we do both. Uh, so you can go around the world right now and see land being cleared. It was being it cleared because of the 2006 America's Energy Independence Act, which made us have ethanol in gasoline that caused 10 million acres of land in, in the United States to be plowed under that had never been plowed before to grow more corn. The same is happening all around the world for a variety of reasons, meeting this growing demand for food. So here, for instance, is uh, habitat conversion in, in uh, uh, Malaysia, in Borneo. Um, for oil palm, but it happens for all crops all around the world. And you can ask how might we use, need less land in the future than it looks like we might be uh, clearing. And a lot of it has to do with how we can improve yields in crops. And the huge advantage we have right now in terms of minimizing future land clearing and its impact is there are large differences between uh, the yields that can be obtained on much of the already cleared farmland around the world and what is being obtained. These are called yield gaps. And I'm not directly illustrating yield gaps here. I'm just showing there's an interesting correlation uh, between the amount, the intensity of agricultural activity, measured here simply as the amount of N applied per hectare per year uh, in, in each, uh, each of these groups of nations, each dot is a year, and the yield they have for crops. And basically, the one signature of low yielding yield, uh, yield gap nations is they really don't have very much input being applied to their crops. And more input can give more yield. And so there's this balance between more input gives more yield, but more input, unless it's used really precisely, has lots of environmental impacts. This is one of the challenges we have to face and, and find really good solutions to. And another challenge we face is that it looks like, this is some work that uh, Ken Kassman and his colleagues have, have, have been done for the uh, last uh, decade or so have been looking at this, uh, but it looks like many crops may have hit what is a real yield limit, that uh, additional breeding, additional agronomic improvements are not leading to increased yields. And it mainly happens when those crops are grown in the places in the world where they have their highest uh, global yields. And those have been stagnant for wheat uh, and rice and a, whole, and a variety of high yielding places around the world now for a decade or more. And so we may not have this continually, continual ability to increase yields around the world just by better agronomic techniques and breeding we may actually have some, uh, some ultimate limits that are faced on how much food we can have. Another constraint, we can't imagine, if you will, that yields will go up forever. If we look at what is happening to populations around the world, what is happening to incomes around the world, the really booming place right now is Sub-Saharan Africa. Rapidly increasing population gonna add a billion and a half or so people in the next 40 or so years, but also increasing uh, GDP, uh, and you can estimate uh, for each country in the world using projected increases in income and in population, what, how food demand might change. And um, this is a ratio of cropland that would be needed in 2060 to that currently farmed in 2010 in each nation in the world. Uh, when you project out 2060 crop demand based upon demand for food crops uh, by people, uh, and based upon the current trajectory of how yields are changing in those countries. And so there are many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that will need three to five times more cropland in uh, 50 years if they keep developing the way they are. And clearing cropland uh, is the major cause that species are being threatened with extinction on Earth. Agri agricultural land clearing is the number one cause. Uh, forestry land clearing is the number two cause. Uh, clearing land for development, urban centers, roads is a third largest cause of extinction risk uh, for animals on Earth using the IUCN data. The lower bar here shows the current IUCN uh, index of extinction risk, the mean ex index of, of extinction risk for all the uh, mammals, large, medium, and small bodied in uh, basically tropical Asia, the first set of bars, uh, in sub Saharan Africa, and in tropical South America. And then the shaded bar on top shows how this index of extinction risk would change uh, in response to the increased population income, food demand, and land clearing uh, projected for the year 2060. Um, right now, to let you know what the, the blue bar means for uh, the SAIC, uh, South Asia, India, and China region, um, 
that has, for the large mammals, 70 some percent of the large mammals there are classified by the IUCN as being already threatened with extinction. And if you look at what that is projected to happen for Sub-Saharan Africa, it would be well above that level for the large mammals of Sub-Saharan Africa by the year 2060. And as we find ways to minimize land clearing and still provide those people with the food that they're going to be demanding. We asked, uh, and this was in a paper in Nature a couple years ago, um, we asked how we, what we might be able to do to minimize these increased risks of extinction. And that's what these bars show is how much we can decrease these increases in, in extinction risk. And uh, basically the three tools we looked at were closing yield gaps, uh, which are the green bar, um, having more efficient agricultural trade between nations, basically having food flow more from high yielding to low yielding nations for each crop. And third, by changes toward healthier diets. And uh, with those three changes, you can alleviate much of the pr uh, projected increase in extinction risk, but not all of it. But a lot of it can be done by, by uh, some combination of those three changes. The last thing I want to mention are greenhouse gases. We know that when you don't use the um, IPCC method of calculating, but actually look at the greenhouse gases directly associated with uh, the full life cycle of agricultural crop production, that about 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. Uh, and if you do some quick back of the envelope calculations, you can ask yourself, given these emissions and given the projected emissions caused by doubling, uh, uh, doubling in global food demand uh, between now and uh, about 50 years from now, um, what might happen to agricultural emissions? And when you do some quick calculations, you realize if you totally stop all fossil fuel combustion by the year 2030, just the global food system would push the world uh, past the one and a half and two degree C uh, climate accord targets well before the end of the century. So that's the pleasant story of the uh, things we face. I'll just mention one more possible solution. I don't see Walt. Is Walter, are you here? No, Walter Willett yet? Okay. I thought he was on the agenda. Um, so we know that diet can be a pretty important lever in achieving environmental uh, goals, as well as in achieving health goals. This is a, a graph from a recent paper that uh, my former student, Mike Clark, was lead author on, uh, that looks at the diet-dependent risk of mortality. And you were on that too, right, Marco? Yes? Lots of, uh, of uh, suspects are here, um, the usual suspects. Um, and then the environmental impacts on a log scale. And you can see that basically the foods that are most associated with uh, high risk of, higher risk of mortality also tend to have higher environmental impacts. And so there's room in here for people eating healthier diets that also provide uh, a, a, a suite of environmental benefits. So that sort of, I tried to outline for all of us sort of the, the big challenges we face, hint at what some of the solutions might be, uh, but our goal today and tomorrow is to have a much deeper discussion of these issues. And especially, I'm hoping we can be coming up with solutions that in our discussions we can find out whether or not they actually are complementary to each other and whether they can be part of a, of a, of a bolder international plan and multifaceted uh, plan to find ways that we can truly feed a full earth. And with that, I get to quit talking, and I love talking. <laughs>